in this episode, I am going to be talking about your, my, everybody's carbon footprint. What is it? And should we worry about it? And just in case you didn't know, there is a trigger warning for this episode. So away we go. This is Stephanie, and this is Truth Detective. I am your personal truth detective, finding all the facts and evidence on just about everything. Society, culture, U.S. news, world news, corruption, our justice system, and so much more. No topic is off limits here. Hey, I just wanted to let you guys know that these episodes are great for finding out the initial information that you need, but they are in no way complete. I have all my links in the show notes for you to continue with the research question everything and share it because that's when the real truth comes out. I want to thank my first time listeners for tuning in to Truth Detective. I really appreciate it. And I love the fact that you want to know more about the truth. You can go to truthdetectivepodcast.com to listen to all of my episodes and the show notes have the links that are in each episode. So you don't want to miss that. So here's a question. What is your carbon footprint? Do you know? We all have one and it has everything to do with how much carbon dioxide we use daily, monthly, yearly. (laughs) I went on the interweb and found a bunch of carbon footprint calculators that you can use that will test you on how much carbon emissions you put out into the atmosphere. Here are a few of the questions. And oh, The links for some of these calculators will be in the show notes. For example, I can measure my carbon footprint by how much I drive, how much I fly, and the products I use. Do I eat red meat or any meat? Do I eat plant-based food? Do I have a home that has solar panels? How old is my car and does it use gas? Do I drive long distances? Can I walk most places? And do I walk most places? Where do I fly or travel? Is it domestic? Is it international? Do I buy and wear secondhand clothing? Do I buy things that are delivered to my house by way? of trucks that use diesel fuel. How about plastic straws? And do I use them? By the way, this has nothing to do with the carbon emissions in the atmosphere. Am I a single person that lives alone in a house? Nothing to do with the carbon emissions in the atmosphere. How often do I entertain? This has nothing to do with the carbon emissions in the atmosphere. This is my own personal carbon footprint. But filling out this questionnaire that I did seems invasive and wrong. Maybe hmm, because it is. Let's not beat around the bush. If you are a returning listener here at Truth Detective, you all know how I feel about my privacy. It didn't go unnoticed by me that some of the questions they asked had nothing (laughs) to do with my carbon footprint, but rather just my actions, my everyday actions. Let's look, starting here. What is this carbon footprint we hear and have heard so much about? And is it a concern and threat that is real and happening? Let's read and discover what the true meaning is of a carbon footprint is from dictionary.com. It says here, it is the amount of carbon dioxide or other carbon compounds emitted into the atmosphere by the activities of an individual, a company, or country. This definition also gives the example that one way to reduce a carbon footprint is if you eat fast food often and want to lessen your carbon footprint, plant-based menu items are a good choice. So where exactly did this idea of a carbon footprint begin. Some believe that the carbon footprint is a ploy that the rich and elite use to detract 
from other nefarious activities. Well, that's almost true, but here's the rub. Have you ever heard the expression, never let a crisis go to waste? That is exactly what is happening when you are worried, when you are thinking about, when you are stressing over your carbon footprint and your carbon emissions output. Here's the truth that some people don't know about. On the EPA website, there's this gem of an article entitled Deepwater Horizon BP Gulf of Mexico oil spill. On April 20th, 2010, the oil drilling rig Deepwater Horizon operating in the Macondo Prospect in the Gulf of Mexico exploded and sank, resulting in the death of 11 workers on the Deepwater Horizon and the largest spill of oil in the history of marine oil drilling operations. Four million barrels of oil flowed from the damaged Macondo well over an 87-day period. Boy, oh boy, before it was finally capped on July 15th, 2010. On December 15, 2010, the United States filed a complaint in district court against BP for the spill. It is believed that BP, British Petroleum, and the oil spill is the making of the carbon footprint. In an article entitled The Messy Truth About Carbon Footprints, there's this. How much attention should we pay to our carbon footprint? That question is the subject of a contentious debate that's been raging in climate circles for quite some time. In one camp, the folks from a recent op-ed for The Guardian argued that big oil invented carbon footprints as a deliberate attempt to blame us for their greed. In the other camp are people who assert that the concept of a carbon footprint was simply co-opted by fossil fuel interests and that it still has value in illuminating the vast inequality that exists between low and high carbon lifestyles. The wealthiest 10% of the global population includes most people responsible for more than 50% of global emissions between 1990 and 2015. The work of the oil giant and one of the world's largest advertising gurus created a successful, deceptive PR campaign designed to transfer the blame for an increasing amount of heat-trapped carbon pollution from companies like British Petroleum, commonly referred to as BP, to individuals like you and me. In the same way that Smokey Bear advises that one person, only you, can prevent a forest fire. Thanks to British Petroleum, or BP, and their advertising team, we're convinced that every move we make has a potential to heat the atmosphere. Well, it is said it's been two decades since British Petroleum and the marketing agency then named Ogilvy & Mather deceived lots and lots of unwitting Americans into believing the hands of fossil fuel companies are clean by contributing to climate change through imaginative messaging. To this day, their marketing campaign continues to be highly effective in getting the public to take on the weighty responsibility of halting climate change. We've cut back on me upped our recycling game and made the creative campaign's key phrase, carbon footprint, part of our vernacular, all to make a positive difference and, yes, to clear our own minds of the guilt that we feel. Shifting the blame is the name of the game. Fossil fuel industries would do well to find innovative ways to reduce their carbon footprint instead of pouring massive amounts of money into manipulating you and me. And was it up to you and me to make everything on the planet change for the better? Hmm. And this is where the carbon footprint belief and the elite's hypocrisy combine. Back in 2019, the Biden administration czar, John Kerry, was asked about his private airplane travel. When asked by an Icelandic reporter why John Kerry rode on planes with big carbon footprints, Kerry gives an answer that is flip and sarcastic. Listen here. On that issue, pollution, I understand that you came here with a private jet. Is that an environmental way to travel? If you offset your carbon, it's the only choice for somebody like me who is traveling the world to win this battle. The time it takes me to get somewhere, I can't sail across the ocean, I have to fly to meet with people and get things done. But what I'm doing, almost full time, is working to win the battle of climate change. I'm not going to be put on the defensive. 
But he's not the only one. Then there's Mr. Bill Gates, a climate guru if ever there was one. From the Western Journal, I found an interesting article that seems to tell us that even Bill Gates has a few guilty pleasures that aren't healthy for the atmosphere of the planet. You see, billionaire Bill Gates, who has fashioned himself as some sort of climate warrior, has a guilty pleasure that goes completely against his espoused views on helping the climate. The Microsoft founder turned climate activist owns no less than four business jets, which he calls his guilty pleasure. His collection is worth close to $200 million and features not one but two Gulfstream jets. G650s. What's more, he has just invested billions of dollars in the world's largest business jet service provider. Yes, it's ironic, as it sounds. The man who wrote the book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, owns a small fleet of fuel-guzzling, carbon-emitting planes. Gates has even confessed to his little guilty pleasure, but also defended it as a necessity for his work, the same as John Kerry did. So everyone needs to change their lives Unless, of course, their name happens to be Bill Gates. And yes, even Newsweek has questions for Bill Gates. He did try to defend his ownership and use of private jets, saying that he was an imperfect messenger for climate change and that he uses clean aviation fuel. Hmm. I am offsetting my carbon emissions by buying clean aviation fuel and funding carbon capture and funding a low-cost housing project to use electricity instead of natural gas. And so I have been able to eliminate it. And it was amazing to me how expensive that was, that cost to be green was. We've got to drive that down. Gates justifying his private jet use with that kind of logic is like, well, a murderer trying to say that he offsets killing people by cooking dinner for his family and helping old ladies cross the street. Well, hey, give him a pat on the back for trying to do the right thing. But doing something right doesn't somehow cancel out doing something wrong. Am I right? Gates could have opted for a more eco-friendly jet like the ACJ-220, which is the quietest, cleanest, and most eco-friendly aircraft in its category, featuring a 50% reduced noise footprint compared to previous generation aircraft and up to 25% lower fuel burn. But instead, Gates has hit records as a flying polluter. Well, the Lund University calculated Bill Gates producing an astonishing 10,000 times more carbon emissions from flying than the average person. Hmm, he causes at least 1,600 tons of CO2 to be emitted into the atmosphere, and this is from flying alone. If Gates really was the climate crusader that he brands himself to be, he should be horrified by this data. So, Gates is either a complete hypocrite or is truly naive enough to think that he is doing enough for the climate and that he can get by flying private jets. And here's this from thetab.com, an article entitled The Celebs Who Have Racked Up the Most CO2 Emissions This Year Using Their Private Jets. Research from sustainability-driven digital marketing agency Yard found so far this year, through their private jet usage, the average celebrity has created 3,376.64 tons of CO2 emissions. To put that into perspective, that is over 482.37 times more than the regular person who averages just 7 tons per year flying commercially. These are the celebrities who are the biggest climate change offenders. Some of the offending celebrities are Oprah Winfrey with flight emissions of 3,000 493.17 tons. In 2022, the American presenter Powerhouse Oprah has already taken 68 flights on her $75 million private jet, creating 3,493 tons of carbon emissions, 499 tons more than the average person like you and me. Kim Kardashian has a flight emissions of 4,268.5 tons in 2002 alone. Kim's jet emitted 4,253.5 tons of carbon emissions over 57 flights, which is 609.8 times more than the average person emits in a year. Once again, that's like you and me. Kim's average flight time is 85.49 minutes for an average journey length of 99.78 miles, with her shortest flight just a mere 23 minutes within 
California. And how about Taylor Swift, a carbon footprint crusader with CO2 flight emissions this year, totaling 8,293.54 tons. She is racking up a total of 170 flights on her private jet since January. Taylor has amassed a vast 22,923 minutes in the air, or 15.9 days. Considering that she is not currently touring. This is a huge amount. Taylor's average flight time is 80 minutes with an average of 139.36 miles per flight. Shameful. Taylor, you ought to walk the walk if you're going to be a carbon footprint crusader. And here is an article entitled, Why Your Carbon Footprint is Meaningless, Distraction Versus Action. Liberals who call for personal sacrifice to combat climate change aren't helping, they're hurting. If you run the numbers, it's obvious that even if every do-gooder that wants to lessen their carbon footprint changed their light bulbs to LED bulbs and stopped going on vacation, none of this would make a dent in global carbon dioxide emissions. They're just aren't enough bleeding hearts to go around. Moreover, individual behaviors are not the major cause of global warming. The major drivers are collective enterprises like power grids, industry, and transportation systems. Cutting back on flying while allowing cars and trucks to operate, as usual, is like drinking diet soda with a bacon double cheeseburger. Their benefit is negligible and negated by the much, much larger problems that are going unchecked. Fighting global warming takes systematic change, collective action, and cooperation, witting or not, among much larger populations, not just those motivated and privileged enough to make changes by themselves. It takes legislation to shift the most carbon-intensive industries, energy production, transportation, and food production that will not change on their own. If fighting global warming is about making annoying personal sacrifices, those who most need to be persuaded of climate change's reality will instead turn away from it, back into the grid. Nor, in the long term, will it even matter if everyone switches off their lights. Demand may go down a tiny bit, but only a tiny bit. What would help? If power grids shifted from fossil fuels like coal, fracked gas, and oil to renewables like wind and solar. That's how to move the needle on global warming, collective solutions to collective problems. But that takes collective action, government action, and serious plans for workers displaced by the changes. I would go on and on, but the point is the same every time. Individual actions are meaningless when collective actions aren't taken. So why do we do them then? Control and consolation. For those who understand the science, global warming is a terrifying reality. It says here in the same article, my daughter's world will be so much worse than mine. And there are so many people that think this way. Changing your behavior feels empowering, maybe even virtuous. The world may be going to hell, you think, but you are doing your part. Well, indeedy, self-deprivation is part of the point. Making painful sacrifices, it feels like you're making a difference, right? Unfortunately, not only is this view false, but it's also profoundly counterproductive. And then there's this article from Mashable, The Carbon Footprint Sham, A Successful Deceptive. PR campaign. Of course, no one should be shamed for declaring an intention to reduce their carbon footprint. That's because BP's advertising campaign proved brilliant, as I stated before. The oil giant infused the term into our normal, everyday lexicon. And the sentiment is not totally wrong. Some personal efforts to strive for a cleaner world do matter. But there's now powerful, plain evidence. That's the term. Carbon footprint was always, always... (laughs) a sham, and should be considered in a new light, not the way a giant oil conglomerate who just a decade ago leaked hundreds of millions of gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico wants to frame your climate impact. 
And then there's the media, which has been no big help in having us understand what's going on with our carbon footprint and our offsetting of carbon footprints and the idea of how we can make the world better. But instead, the fear porn is the name of the game when it comes to mainstream media. Charlie Chester, technical director, has this to say about the carbon footprint and climate change. Brought to you by Project Veritas's undercover video. He says the next wave after the pandemic fear porn will be climate change. And true to his word, that is exactly what has happened. We are now all about climate change and the carbon footprint in today's mainstream media. Do you remember in 2019, we all were hit with an unknown pandemic. The only thing we were told is that it came from a faraway country, China, claiming it was the worst pandemic in humanity in centuries and maybe ever. Lockdowns, isolation, confinement. This was truly a gift to some. This, after all, allowed perhaps BP to tell everyone to reduce their carbon footprint and cemented the carbon footprint sham and left many questioning things, including the timing of the event and the government officials involved by not driving to work and flying on planes, the carbon footprint that was touted for decades as being important now had the reasons for the new developments, that of our own, which was translated to the pandemic's fault by default. We all must do our parts to save the planet. We only have a few years after all. We have tons of carbon on the planet from car power plants, planes, and industry that will be still adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. But this sounds bad, right? Hmm. In 2020s, the deposits of carbon dioxide will only be slightly less than a few years prior. So I ask you, is it worth giving up the wonderful luxuries in life to get to net zero carbon emissions or close to that, that we have all been told at nauseum sometimes we ought to care about? When some individuals hear about what they will have to give up. It's a bleak existence at best. Even celebrities and well-known people are not all there as far as their own carbon footprint. So here's my takeaway from this episode. Life is to be enjoyed. What is the meaning of life and why are we here? We don't want to be living in a sad, depressing world. We want to have all the joys in life and we really ought to. And my call to action, just one this time, do what you feel is right for you. Don't let others persuade you to feel a way that doesn't feel right for you. If you want to make a difference around your home and living area, do so. But if you, like many others, want to enjoy a life of your own making, feel free to do that. Others ought to look in the mirror for their own changes they want to make. Mentioned in the first part of this episode, maybe Smokey the Bear had it right in a way. Only you can do that. Only you can make the changes. Only you live your life and do what you ought to do to be happy. Hey, if you've enjoyed this episode, that's great. And I love that. Email me at truthdetectivepodcast at gmail.com to give me your feedback and possibly a topic that I can do. Go to truthdetectivepodcast.com to get to all my episodes and the show notes with the links from that episode. There's also a little bio on me if you're wondering what I'm all about. As always, subscribe to Truth Detective to get the notifications of when new episodes come out. That is so cool. I'll see you next time on Truth Detective. Okay, bye-bye.